emotional suffering is difficult because it puts you in a dark place. And I know a person who lost their husband. And I wasn't talking with her, but I was talking with somebody who was talking with her. And they said she was going to bed at 6 o'clock at night. And I said, that's a sign of depression. Because you just wear out. You just need more sleep. You just you don't want to face the world. Anyway, that's what I said. Um, from the viewpoint that I see it with my children is that I see now where I am separated from all of them. And yet I can see the progression of what is going on in their lives. And there is where the emotional uh, factor comes in. And you don't know what you can do about it except to pray. Okay, here first. Building on what Larry said, um, when I was in physical pain, it did develop into depression. And the only relief for me, because they won't let you have the drugs anymore that help with pain because you could get addicted, so um, I couldn't stay on those drugs. And I, w I just stayed in bed all day. Mm. And um, that... Actually, I did a lot of praying while I was in bed. I did an awful lot of sleeping. And I did find that I became more depressed when I did that. So I kind of realized that and um, would force myself hmm. to get up and stay up. And then things turned around along with PT and everything else. Frequently, physical pain results in emotional pain. Yes. I think there are two kinds of people that deal with things differently. One, that want to find answers to their emotional pain, and others that just want to, like, have it seep inside and not really um, acknowledge it. Um, Tom and I are like that. I seek answers, and he's a, he, he just likes to have it go inside. Um, mm. So, anyway, people deal with that differently. Yeah. And some people want to talk about it, and some people don't want you around. Similar. Yes. Any other thoughts? I want to miss anyone. I think you've got to constantly be telling yourself the truth to get out of it. Hmm. Not a buddy get out of it, but to change the way you're looking at things. For example, one day I was driving out to church. It had been a long winter. There was still snow on the ground. And I thought, what an ugly rotten day. <laughs> but then I thought, well, what if this was a painting? Would you appreciate the painting? And I would. Hmm. And I said, well, why don't you think of it in terms of that and look at it as pretty versus something that's ugly? <laughs> I mean, there were just those things daily that you uh, tell yourself. And it's indicative of where you're at. Sure. I just talked to someone uh, recently, and I felt bad. I felt guilty, I felt sad, I felt ashamed. Um, I know this person pretty well, and they were in a dark place and suffering. And I kind of had an idea. I mean, they were kind of telling me that, and I didn't reach out. I didn't reach out. And they're doing fine now, but I should have reached out. I should have come alongside them. And I'm not good at that. I, I'm not good at that. I try, I try to be sensitive to people, but it just seems like later, two weeks later or something, I go, well, I should have done something. And it's hard. And I think a lot of times you can assume at least 60 to 70% of our population are suffering with something. And I know it goes in degrees, but we all need people to come alongside and be a friend or reach out. Now, if they don't want you, they'll tell you. But most of the time, people will say, yeah, I'll talk to you about it. And we should do that, especially as Christians. The book of Job gives us a unique insight into a view from the unseen world beyond our comprehension. 
As we reflect on the scope of the entire Bible, we can make some interesting observations. One observation is that whether in the Old Testament when God communicated more directly, or in the New Testament when Jesus communicated directly, or through the apostles or the work of the Holy Spirit, miracles did not foster long-term belief. Miracles did not foster long-term belief. Actually, these miracles were often when there was faithlessness. Why do you think that was? People are constantly saying, well, if I could just see Jesus, then I would believe. Or if Jesus would just perform a miracle, then I would believe. Or if Jesus would heal me, then I would believe. Jesus did that. And more often than not, they didn't have faith. Why? Surely you know. I think one of the things, and you raise your hand when, you, when you're ready, but one of the things that I think is remarkable is that you can have the most logical, reasonable argument or reasons for accepting Christ. And some people are receptive and some people aren't. I have met with people, and I ha I've written a book about why you should believe. There are all these reasons, and I'm thinking, all they have to do is read my book, and boom, we're in. <laughs> no. No. Yes. I don't have an answer, but I do think that part of it is God's miracle, which we don't see or understand how somebody's heart gets receptive to faith and somebody's isn't. Yeah. Like you said, you could do a mathematical equation to somebody and say, right, it works. And they say no. Yeah. I think that is one of the fascinating things about faith is God looks at the heart. And we see just the external. And boy, they can be different. People can really fake us out. Yes. I think we tend to put God-like expectations on human beings, hmm. and they always let us down. Yeah. And as a result, we end up putting human expectations on God, hmm. and then we miss them. Oh, interesting. That's great insight. <laughs> All right, I'll move on. Feel free to come back to that. I'm sorry, David, I wrote this before you thought you'd be in here. I thought you'd be in the new members class this morning. But We should not long for the good old days of manna from heaven. You ever hear people talk about the good old days? I remember the good old days when I was young. I didn't like them. We had outdoor toilet. And a mean goose that used to chase me back and forth as I ran from the house to the toilet. Those were not good old days. <laughs> My good friend David Hodges shared with me how to do a life timeline. It's like an echocardiogram. How many of you had an echocardiogram? So, of those, Ray, keep raising your hand, how many know what an echocardiogram is? Who can explain it? Who can explain what an echocardiogram is? It's how we monitor the heartbeat, and when it's placed on us, it goes through the different waves, the PQRST, and it should look a certain way when the heart is beating normally, and when it's not beating normally, it shows up. And then when it stops beating, it's flatline, right? Correct. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means you're... That's a bad sound. Pretty dead. Yeah. And so... There's this squiggly line in the normal range, and it can go outside of the normal range. And so David shared with me how to do a lifetime line. It's like an echocardiogram with a baseline of zero. So you have zero along your chronological age, 
And along the bottom of the graph, there are lines going above and below the ages where your life has had very difficult times and wonderful times. So wonderful, not good. And it goes along. And it co correlates to your age. I did that. And as I looked at it, I wondered what would happen if I overlaid that diagram with my perception of when I had the least or most spiritual growth. Not surprisingly, the correlation was incredible. The most growth and feeling of closeness to God occurred during the spikes below the line, <laughs> and the least growth occurred during the spikes above the line. So, worst times, more growth. Best times, least growth, spiritually. In other words, I experienced more spiritual growth when I was going through trials than when my life was going well. What might be some of the reasons for that? And how do you define spiritual growth? What does it look like? I think that when things are going well, maybe we don't, we don't think of God as much. We don't need him as much. And so maybe our prayer life falls off. Or, but when we are below the line and things aren't good, uh, a lot of the time the only place to go is God. And even... I've learned that even when things are going really well, I know that that won't last forever. And so I'm always praying ahead for like my, my children and my grandchildren. And I, I uh, even when things are going well, because I've lived for a long time and I know that um, that's not always going to be the case. Mm -hmm. I didn't know God was what I needed until God was the only thing I had. Any other thoughts? Kind of quiet this morning. You can argue with me if you don't agree with something. That'll get us going. We discussed last week how we should take a look from God's point of view instead of from our point of view when examining suffering and evil. God does not overpower all skeptics with a flashing miracle. Rather, God seeks to love and be loved. That's really the bottom line. The Bible shows a clear progression of God's effort to break through to human beings, from God the Father who hovered like a parent over the Hebrews from the top down, or from God the Son, Jesus, who taught the will of God from the bottom up, and now today the Holy Spirit who literally fills us with the presence of God. We are wonderfully privileged to carry out God's will here on earth. To do that, we need to know God's will. God has a decreed will and a secret will and a clearly defined will. The will of God really comes in three categories. Decreed, secret, clearly defined. Can you help me sort those wills out? Someone define one of those wills until we have defined all three. Go ahead, go for it. Grab one. Explain it. Limit yourself to 10 minutes. I've always thought of his will in two terms. His decretive and uh, the secret, meaning the secret is what he's planned for all the ages. <clears throat> and uh, the decretive is what he's told us in Scripture. Is that what you mean by... I could live with that. The clearly defined will could be under decreed. Yeah, that it's what he's spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can live with that. And the other one is what he's doing behind the scenes, but we just, only he knows it until it comes to pass. You See, know. Yes. Yeah. So, any other thought? People are always asking, what's the will of God? How can I know the will of God? I 
I'm going to take you back about 21 years ago. Okay. Short time for just me. Just let you know how um, God's will worked in our life. Rudy had no inclination at all of running for office. We were just retired from our business. And he was home and working around the house. I was at, still in the store, and these two, a pastor from Cambridge, or Utica, came from the Bible church, and he was looking for Rudy. <clears throat> I said, what do you want Rudy for? And he said, well, uh, we are having God and government weekend, and Rudy's name came up that he might want to run for <laughs> office that was a state assembly seat that was open. And uh, I said, well, I have to ask him, but... Rudy never went to college, but a lot of people knew Rudy because he's been in just about everybody's house crawling on their floor. And uh, anyhow, I went home and told Rudy, and he thought I was joking. Anyway, to shorten it up a little bit, the whole walk was a God thing, seeking out God's will, if he wanted this to happen or not. But like Rudy said, and we learned it from I learned it from Jim Billhorn. First, you must be willing yeah. to be open to God's will, whatever it is. And we prayed about it, and they said, be sure, be sure your wife is in agreement with you, because otherwise, don't even try it, <laughs> yes. which is true. But uh, we just laid it out, and we were reading in the devotional book, and it, we talked about God's will, and we made all these excuses, oh, the hill is too high, we can't climb it and different excuses, but in the end it said, where God guides, he provides, and that's what we claimed, and it turned out to be God's will, although we, he was not seeking that seat. Sure. He said, I was working around the house, I kind of gave that up. <laughs> God's decreed will, and people who ask about, how can I know God's will for my life, are... are one and the same, as Larry pointed out without using the mic, obedience. God has given us the opportunity to study the inspired word that he has provided for our instruction and edification, and we should take advantage of that. And the more consistent the Silvas were in their life living for Christ, the easier it was for them to discern God's will because you understand who God is and how you might be able to serve. That would be my interpretation of that. And there may be specifics that you pray for and look for a, a test or a, a litmus test or a, a fleece or how you describe it. But for the most part, we have an understanding of who God is, and we are to become Christ-like to the point that as a Christian, we understand what we should do because it's consistent with what God would want us to do. About 30 years ago, I started working as a counselor at one of the largest Christian high schools in the country, and about 500 students I work with, and I, I'm pretty sure I could count on one hand the number of uh, students that were seeking God's will. In this particular room here, I think there's probably a whole lot more they're doing that. But, you know, as I was just sitting here thinking about this and thinking, those people that really, really want to seek God's will, I think those are the ones that probably it's going to be pretty easy to find it because he's going to be so pleased that they want to do that. But I think the number of people that are really seeking what he wants for their life is really in a minority. I think many people are seeking God's blessing on what they want for their will. Debbie? Just as I was sitting here listening to Janet and then David, that it, I think if we just strive to know God, if we have a desire to know God and we seek him, he'll reveal himself. He does reveal himself, and, he re and, and that's, that's his will. It's he gives us, that when you say God will give me guidance, I mean, he isn't going to send a sign down and say, here's your sign. But he reveals himself as you yep. get to know him. And, but you have to have a desire to, and, and just as they said, some of the ways are 
reading his word. That's how that's what how we get to know him. Spending time talking with him, mm -hmm. and but and he does reveal himself. And it's I just can't even describe how, but it does happen. But you have to want to be by him. Yes, it's very similar to what Charles shared. Uh, Charles shared that about two weeks ago, and I was appreciative of those comments. It's very very similar. So, so how does God's will fit into our understanding of the book of Job? Where are we to learn about God's will from this book? The silence is deafening. What do I mean? How do we understand God's will by reading the, and understanding the book of Job. Is there any correlation there between God's will and the book of Job? Well, what comes to pass must be God's will, unless you're just choosing disobedience. But in life, in life events, what comes to pass is his will. In the book of Job, we see he permitted it to happen, but it still was in his divine will. Exactly. And that's tough. So, <clears throat> so when you suffer, you know, unless it's because you, you know, your own stupidity or something. Um, even then, though, I would, I would backtrack and say, even then, God has willed it for us to learn. You know what I mean? But what comes to pass is His will, whether He permitted it or designed it. Um, you know, and I think we should accept it that way, and be able to relate to Him with that truth, to bear through it. There. Are you got a comment over here, David? I've always kind of struggled with the book of Job because um, we kind of know some of the backstory. We kind of know that it was a conversation between Satan and God, and it was a, uh, God allowed it to happen. But um, Job, it, I think what we can learn about God's will is that God has faith in us. If we're willing to follow him, he will faithfully uphold us, and he faithfully upheld. And I think that is his will, is that the relationship Job had with God after it was over was much closer and was much better and was, um, it's hard to believe, but Scripture tells us that he, um, his, his love for God was enhanced and that he enjoyed the rest of his life even more which is hard to believe because he went through incredible loss to get there. But um, I don't know. It, Job is a hard book to understand, I think. It is. That's why we're studying it, to try and figure it out a little bit. Yes. I think one of the things that the book of Job teaches about, our, about God's will is that God's will is often bigger than us. What happened to Job really wasn't about Job. There was something else bigger going on in the events that happened to him have now been, I mean, God used that um, and has been using that for thousands of years now to, yes. to teach and encourage. And so it was much bigger than Job or his wife or his kids or any of that. Yeah. Very true. I want to qualify what I said because I think I was wrong. So we can bring suffering upon ourselves because of our choices, you know, for evil or our own stupidity. But... I'm going to even, if God work, works all things together for the good, then he permits us or allows us to choose evil. And even in that, we can learn and grow from it. Hence, you know, it, even that is a part of his will. Yeah. It, 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 you, you break the word of God, which is his will, but you're within the design of his design for your life through those experiences. So even I would sin, agree I guess, can work for the good. I would agree with that, but I'd have to draw a box around it. And I would have to say that it's qualified because we're talking about believers. Because I think Satan can use people, too, in the trials and temptations and mm -hmm. travails of the world. And we're defining this through the eyes of a Christian. Yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought he had some money. Sorry. I get stuck in this too. Um, kind of what Debbie was saying. 
because God and Satan already had the conversation. And no matter what we talk about in life, when we're talking about God being involved in it, it always seems paradoxical, like we talked about last week. There is no time where God is concerned. So when he created Job, he knew that this event was going to already happen with Satan, and he still allowed it. And then when we, you know, so, so he wasn't surprised by it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And he's not surprised by any of it. And because he lives in infinity, and we live in finite and in a timeline, it, even though we're here, God's already seen all of it already. And that's where I get stuck in trying to define my small bit of understanding to his infinite wisdom and all-knowingness. But when we step into obedience and surrender and start walking with God and his will, and we can know that no matter what happens in our life, his will toward us is love and growing a deeper relationship. But because of sin and our fallen state, there's going to be times when we're, rocking, you know, when we're walking on coals in order to, hot coals in order to get to where we're going with him. And it just continues to be kind of paradoxical. It's mm -hmm. hard to explain. Incomprehensible. It's a tough, it's a tough assignment. The book of Job is a book of great beauty and emotional intensity. Job is an epic drama, much like an epic poem, the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer. Job is also written as a record of historical events. Job was a man who actually lived. And based on the ancient tablets that have been found referencing Job, it's believed that he lived around the time of Abraham, about 4,000 years ago, or about 2,000 BC. As we read the beginning of Job chapter 1, we get our first indication of why there is suffering in the world. According to Satan's challenge to God, suffering often comes from Satan's rebellion against the government of God. In Job chapter 1, we're given reasons why there is suffering in, the, in this world, and especially why innocent people suffer. And yet there is an even deeper look behind the book of Job. In this scene, we see the book of Job was written in part to reveal to us the relationship between God and Satan. I've often been confused why God would even talk to Satan, but in this book we see that God communicates directly with Satan. However, God does not want us confused about the power of this vicious enemy. Satan is deadly and powerful. Satan hates God and Satan hates us, but Satan is not the equivalent of God. He's under God's authority. There are not two gods in the universe, a good God and an evil God called Satan. Satan is a created being, created by God, a fallen angel. Satan is not God's equal. And the book of Job shows us right from the start that God is under the control of things. Time and space and all the universe are under God's authority. God is the almighty maker of heaven and earth and we pray to him. We do not command him. Everything in the universe must acknowledge that he is the Lord of all. Even rebellious Satan must confess that God is in control and there's nothing Satan can do in heaven and earth except with permission of God. Chapter 1 of Job is not a battle between two equal foes on the battlefield. It's not a battle in the conventional sense. It's not warfare between these two forces. In fact, Satan must get permission from God before he can do anything. So if it's not a war, what is it? How would you describe what's going on between God and Satan in chapter 1 of Job? Hand here. Satan wanted to have permission from God if he could test Job. If he would take away all his flocks and his kids and everything, that he, would he still trust in God? And Job passed the test. So it was a lot about it's a trust. Test. And it's a test and for it was us, a test. too, when things come our way, how are we going to handle it? 
Say that again. When things come our way that we are not looking out for trouble, but when it comes to us, people are watching us to see how we respond. That's interesting. Respond to things that losing your spouse or your child is dying. And the world is watching because they're, they know you're a Christian. They want to see, you know, is it going to stand up? And it is a test. Excellent. Someone else? In the back and then over here. I think that uh, Rick and Mary Bergendahl um, have shown me in the last week how they have handled some things. And one of the things is um, they decided to bury Nora's ashes so that Maya and Keaton would have a place to go and bury them in, in their plot, Rick and Mary's plot, so that her children, Nora's children, Maya and Keaton, would have a place to go. And a, 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 a headstone where their mother's name was. And I think we all need that. One of the things they considered was to spread her ashes around their home and around the farm where Nora grew up. And they decided against that. Um, and so the decisions they're making are for the grandchildren. And there are several others too, but they're all for the grandchildren. And I think that has taught me a lot. I know when Rick was sharing in the first service last Sunday about this tragedy, or was it the week before, he said he was asking us to pray for the, for the children. Uh, you know, that's his biggest concern. And I just, my heart just went out, you know. Yes, go ahead. Um. I find Satan as a rebellious servant to God because although Satan can't really do anything without God's permission, God does let him do certain things because Satan thinks bad th only bad things could come from what his deeds do, but God knows that good can come from all of them. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I thank you, and I will see you next week.